Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsein. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we are revisiting a conversation we had last year with Kara Golden. Uh, Kara is the CEO of Hint, which is best known for uh, the, the leading unsweetened flavored water. She's an entrepreneur. She grew her uh, brand, which is a well-known brand from the back of her Jeep uh, when she first started. And uh, she has uh, continued to be recognized as a great business leader, as an entrepreneur. Uh, she has been uh, named by Fortune's uh, Most Powerful Women Entrepreneurs and Forbes 40 Women to Watch Over 40. And uh, she is an author. Her newest book is Undaunted. And uh, she is also an active speaker and writer and hosts the podcast, The Kara Golden Show, where she interviews founders and entrepreneurs and other disruptors in various industries. Looking forward to revisiting our conversation with Kara. Uh, so happy to have uh, Kara joining us today. And uh, Kara, I guess, first off, and I'm sure people are aware of your product, uh, Hint, but maybe they don't know uh, some of the backstory of, of your career. And I uh, would love to just get just a quick overview of, of your career as we uh, start the podcast. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. So I, I uh, started this company, um, Hint Water, in case you're uh, happen to be viewing this, but otherwise it's, uh, it's called Hint, and we are in over 30,000 stores throughout the U.S. today and actually sell online on our site at drinkhint.com and then also on Amazon, uh, but it didn't start out that way. And so it's, uh, it's a 15-year-old startup, and, um, and I uh, I started it with no experience in the beverage industry. I came from tech and prior to that media um, and really was looking to solve a problem that I had um, around my own health, which I didn't even know how to define it other than the fact that I had gained a bunch of weight over the course of a few uh, a few pregnancies and couldn't lose it and then had a uh, had t developed terrible adult acne, which I like couldn't figure out exactly why I'd gotten this when I didn't even have it as a teenager. And then also my energy levels were just super low, which had never been how I would have like defined myself. I never really had an issue with it. And so after leaving my role at AOL, um, which I was there for seven years, I ran the e-commerce partnerships for AOL. Um, and really was there during a time when it was, you know, just an idea until it became a billion dollars in revenue to the company. I was decided to really make a commitment to my family to try and get something a little closer to home. I was on the plane all the time. United Airlines pilots all knew me by my first name. I'm like, sure. this, there's something really wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know, I need to go back to San Francisco and stay home a little bit. I had three kids under the age of four. Wow. And that's when I decided, in addition to sort of figuring out what I want to do next and find that next, you know, job, what I also want to figure out is my health and how do I solve these problems? And, you know, it's an interesting when you, when you make a decision to lose weight and like, and solve these other problems, it's not like you even share it with people, right? You just sort of like make this commitment to yourself and, and that's what I had been doing and, and really nothing was working um, to that I was trying. Like I tried diets, I tried, you know, eating different things. I was watching calorie, counting my calories and reading labels. And, um, and I remember one day this, um, this Diet Coke can that I had been drinking a ton of Diet Coke over the years, didn't think that there was anything wrong with my, you know, Diet Coke. And then when I looked down at the ingredients, I saw it had more ingredients, in some cases more ingredients than even the food that I was eating. And it like didn't sort of follow the rules that I had placed on the food that I was putting in my body. And I thought, I don't even understand what I'm putting in my body. Like I care more about sure. what I'm putting in my car than what I'm put, putting into my body. And again, I had these young kids at home and I had been really focused on, 
you know, what was wrong with a lot of these, you know, foods that I was starting to give to them. And yet for me, like I just hadn't really paid attention. So that's when I made this decision to eliminate diet soda, even temporarily from my life, um, you know, for a couple of weeks just to see what would happen. And I'd start drinking water. And that's when, um, you know, I started slicing up fruit and threw it in water in order to get myself to drink water because I hated water. I thought it was totally boring. I like, you know, had convinced myself for years that my diet soda was actually like water somewhere in there and, and, you know, forget about all the rest of the stuff. But again, because it was calling itself diet, it was labeled diet. It probably was fine. Like somebody's watching out there. And that's when, um, two and a half weeks later, after making the shift, I um, lost 24 pounds in two and a half weeks. It was like, boom, wow. all of a sudden my whole body adjusted, my energy levels were back, my skin cleared up. And so it, it became this obsession for me that I thought, why is the world so trusting? of like these words and these labels like diet, like low fat, like vitamin, like all, all of these things. And yet they're like willing to do really hard things like go on a diet or, you know, or live with like health issues because they believe and they're not doing the research or they haven't had the experience that I've had just by making this tiny little switch in my life. And so I was kind of living with this like concept and sort of this lecture that I would share with people, you know, just to kind of get their opinions. And I'd learn about all these different products that were out there like vitamin water that had sort of fooled other people. And that's when I uh, started looking in my local grocery store for, um, for a product like Hint, where it was just fruit and water and no sweeteners. And I was shocked that there wasn't anything that was still water. There were carbonated versions of the product um, that, ha- that had a lot of sodium in, the, in it. Mm-hmm. Since, you know, in the last 15 years, there definitely are carbonated versions that don't have sodium in it. But, um, but at the time, what I really wanted in order to drink a lot of water was a still format. Because if you drink too many bubbles, like you can't drink nine, most people can't drink nine carbonated beverages in a day, sure. like they'll yeah. blow up, right? <laughs> So that was like the theory behind it. And, you know, and part of what I write about in in my new book and is Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters is that I kept thinking that I'd like this product to be out in the market. Um, You know, I didn't have any experience. I had been a successful executive, but I, you know, certainly didn't know what I was doing around beverages. I thought I have no idea how to get it on the shelf at the store. Then another hurdle with how do I actually create a shelf stable product? How do I figure out the distribution? I had lots of doubts about myself, uh, you know, in this process, whether or not I could do it. Then I ran into lots of doubters along the way. I had failures, I had fears, all of these things. And as I've been out speaking over the last few years about building my company, I would run into people who would make these huge statements about me, like after my talk saying like, I'm so not like you, like I don't, you know, I've had failures. I, you know, didn't go to the right school. I, you know, they'd put all these roadblocks in front of them. And, and I, I finally, a couple of years ago, finally started to say, I'm just like you. Like I didn't have any of those things. And maybe I should even go back further and kind of share kind of why none of this should have been able to work. And by the way, like when I launched this company, I had four kids under the age of six. Like it was like, you know, there were a lot of things along the way that I just decided I'm going to go do this. Maybe I went slower. Maybe I, you know, did lots of things, but I felt like through sharing my story about, you know, the idea that, that, if you actually go try and you really go out there and start to you know chip away at the block a little bit then then you can actually accomplish a lot of things and again maybe it'll take you longer maybe it won't be exactly how you envisioned it to be but when you start making you know little tries oftentimes those things add up to some kind of success and some sort of you know energy and ability and and that gives you the perseverance so that is my hope really for getting the story out there is that people will recognize that 
you know, if you, if you have an idea and if you, you know, believe that, you know, you don't have an experience or you have all these ideas why you can't do it, if you really want to do it, I truly believe that you can if you get out of your own way. You've got a lot of stories that you, you share about your, your life and lessons learned uh, in your career in, in the book. And, and I have read it and definitely encourage people to, to go out and, and purchase a copy on yeah. Daunted. But I ask this question of uh, every, every guest that we have on, if you were able to go back to kind of the beginning of, of your career and, and talk to a 22-year-old, uh, Kara, what, what advice would you give her? So I, gosh, so much uh, along the way. I mean, I think I always believed that, that doing something that I wanted to do every single day was critical. I mean, even going back to like being an athlete, like I, I always felt like I want to focus on the things that I want to do. Sometimes I had to do things that I didn't want to do in order to even be a gymnast. I had to go, I, I'm not a good dancer. And so for me, like doing floor exercise, you actually need, you got to have rhythm, like to be able to do that. But what I learned along the way, even like watching people who were better than me, that it's okay to like have people that you're surrounded by people that are better than you right? Like it's at certain things, right? And be confident in what you're ultimately, you know, what you, what you can do really, really well too. And so I feel like there are so many things that I've done along the way that again, I, I hadn't sort of crystallized them and defined them as things that I already believed. But I would say now I would, I would and, and frankly, what I tell my, you know, kids is like, figure out what you want to do every single day right like and maybe there's stepping stones along the way that you're doing stuff that you know you don't hate but you're not like you know super jazzed about it like you know and and but that could help you get to the point where you ultimately you know are doing what you want to do um and then also i i think that if you believe that you're smart and you've been able to, you know, accomplish things along the way. Like no one told me when I was 22 years old, um, you know, that I should look back on my life and, and think about all the hard things that I've accomplished because those will actually prepare me for things going forward, right? Like instead, you're always like, people are always like, oh, look forward, look forward. Yeah, look forward. But the reality is, is that, so much of what prepares you to look forward to is the stuff that you've accomplished. So I'm a huge believer that, you know, the, and that the more, you know, challenges you've had, maybe those challenges came out of risks that you took. Those actually make you able to sort of weather the storm going forward. And so connecting those dots, and again, I think you do that with age, you know, frankly, right. you know, where you're able to like look back and say, God, that was really bad. I, I know how I felt about it then, but it's going to be okay. Right. And so that would be, that would be the biggest um, pieces that I would say to my 22 year old self. Now in your book, you share a story, and I've heard you talk about this, uh, just some of the, the roadblocks that you've had. Uh, you started this company, you went through, uh, there was a difficult time in our economy, just a lot of different things that would happen. And I think a lot of times are that inner voice that says, this isn't going to work, or, you know, I can't do this. I just don't have what it, what it takes. Uh, go back and talk about that story from Starbucks. I, I love that, that story of just how that, you know, things were going well. And then all of a sudden you, you hit a, hit kind of a, a major wall and uh, yeah. how you handled it. Yeah. Crazy time. Um, so we get into Starbucks, which was, you know, a huge woo celebration, right? We're in 11,000 Starbucks. They, they're taking one flavor, the blackberry flavor and, very exciting. And so, you know, I thought I was being super smart by saying, okay, so what is success? Like what, like how many bottles per day, per store, however you can equate it? Like when will we know that you guys are going to be happy with us? Like we have no, and also we have to produce that much product. And so 
took us about six months to sort of hit that goal of, of what they wanted us to be doing. And a year and a half in to the conversation, you know, I'm feeling great. We're like over, you know, what they wanted us to ultimately be selling almost by three times. I mean, it was, mm. it was crazy. And so I'm feeling pretty confident. I'm looking at my, you know, beautiful reports every single day, just thinking, you know, we're killing it. It's great. We get an email from the buyer, the new buyer at Starbucks, who shares with us that we're, um, that we're, she wants to do a phone call. And then we get on the phone. I'm like, super nice to meet you. We love working with you guys. And, and basically her news was, sorry, we're going to discontinue um, the product. I'm like, wait, what? You must be talking to a different vendor. You can't be talking to us. We're, we're killing it. We're doing great. And she said, yeah, we've, you know, had some strategy meetings. We're going to go in a different direction. We're going to put more food in the case. It's like higher ring, higher margin, all of these things. So it was rational, right? Like it was like, she was laying out exactly why they were making this decision, but it didn't work for me. Like it was not going to be like a right. good situation for me. And P.S. I had lots of product in the, in the warehouse and 40% of our business was actually sitting with Starbucks. And, mm. and again, like that is, that is something that, you know, probably when I look back on was probably the biggest thing when I shared with my team and also shared potentially share with my investors that that's what I was thinking about and what, what I feared. Right. And that I had made this like horrible mistake to be sitting here cruising along thinking everything's fine. And then all of a sudden it wasn't. And so once I, you know, sort of got over the fact that we were getting kicked out of there, I, um, and I had to share with our investors, I, you know, said like the good news, it's really bad news, first of all. But the good news is, is that um, we've exposed lots of people throughout the U.S. to our product in areas that we wouldn't have been able to sort of get the product out there. We didn't have mar big marketing budgets to get it out there. Um, but the bad news is, is like we don't really know who the consumer is, right? Like that's Starbucks data. It's not sure. our data. So shortly after kind of having this epiphany, we get this phone call from Amazon and Amazon says, hey, you know, we're doing this grocery business. It's great. Like, and and we'd love for you to be in it. How long will it take for us to get product? And I'm like, well, I got all this product in the warehouse right now. And they're like, oh, we buy it at Starbucks all the time. We love your product. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like, you know, it's like a, it's a bad name right now sitting in my head. Right. And so I didn't even have the nerve to like share with the Amazon buyer that, you know, we're not in Starbucks anymore. All I said was, uh, well, uh, we have a ton of BlackBerry Hint in our warehouse. Would you like it? I can send a truck today because I'm thinking I got to get rid of this product or, you know, kill it. So it gets on Amazon. We become like one of the number one products in Amazon grocery. It's like, you know, amazing. And then about a year into that relationship, I've kind of forgotten about Starbucks, except that I kept saying, I'm never going to do, I'm never going to have so much weight in one company's hands that could make me feel the way that I felt. Like I had been smartened up to sort of like know what I had done wrong. And that's like one lesson that you're supposed to learn from that story too is like I wouldn't have felt so bad about myself and about that story and been so stressed and feared if I didn't have so much weight sitting in one thing, mm -hmm. right? And you can use that example in a lot of different areas of, of your life, right? You care about things when they actually have a lot of impact, right? And so, um, so, but in addition, what I learned from now dealing with Amazon was that we were a year into this business. They were sharing that they love our customers because our customers are speaking about health to them. They're buying other products that have like, you know, that are health, like, you know, diabetes monitors and lots of other stuff. And I said, hey, I'd, I'd really like to reach out to um, our consumers. And they're like, well, they're not really your consumers. They're our consumers. And I'm thinking, well, sort of, but they're buying my product. And, and so the net of it is, is that Jeff Bezos wasn't going to give me the data. Starbucks wasn't going give, to give me the data. And so suddenly I said, the only way I'm going to get the data is actually to start my own direct-to-consumer business. Mm -hmm. 
And so we did that. And today, PS, like that business combined with a small percentage um, from Amazon is 55% of our overall business. So I go back to that triangle and where that started was Starbucks. Because the first thing that that Amazon buyer said to me was, oh, we buy it at Starbucks. And I was thinking, ah, you know, like, but, <laughs> but I was like, you know, it's interesting because, you know, things will happen to you along the way and they will not go the way that you think. Um, but can you a look at what you did wrong? Like why this hurts so bad? B what can you do? You know, what else can you do in order to kind of try and make up for this? But also the big lesson that I've learned and, and this is really in life is that everything connects eventually, I think. And so, and, and it really is like so fun to kind of look back on life and say, ah, that's why this happened, right? And so then nothing's ever a waste of time or I should have never done that because I really believe that Amazon or maybe our direct-to-consumer business, which is so successful today, we would not have had that like you know, epiphany or maybe the courage or whatever to do those things if we didn't have kind of, I view it as really this triangle, it all kind of connects in there. So again, like, you know, so many lessons there, but I think it's oftentimes some, you know, something that whether you're an entrepreneur or, you know, you're, you're thinking about this year and, and living in the pandemic as so much has gone wrong. And, you know, and, and I, and instead I always look at, you know, when hard things happen, figure out what you can gain from them. And I think that that's an important thing for everyone to, you know, look at moving forward. So what have you, what lessons have your leadership lessons have you learned during this pandemic? Uh, it's, you know, up ended a lot of businesses uh, the last eight months. And, and, uh, but it seems like there's the leaders that are stepping forward and leading during this time, even though they don't uh, exactly understand everything that's going on. I think in your uh, book, you had a chapter that was entitled building the airplane while you are flying it. And that's, I think that's kind of this year a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I think that the, that the biggest thing is that, you know, you can't always control things and you can't always forecast things. We couldn't forecast, um, you know, a, we didn't forecast a pandemic. Maybe there's some people out there that did, but not us. And, but we were pr pretty darn prepared um, to actually be able to kind of, um, you know, weather the storm. That's how I view it or, or fly the plane while building it. And so I think really figuring out like what things work um, that we have control over, what things don't work and, you know, continuing to diversify our, um, you know, ways that we get revenue into the company too. We didn't have all our eggs in one basket prior to this. We were constantly looking at, you know, not necessarily planning for a pandemic, but really thinking, okay, let's go try these things. Oh, those are pretty, working pretty well. Let's still, you know, coddle this business over here and this business here. And so, you know, today we view ourselves as an omni-channel brand that is really focusing on the customer. And, but, you know, if you only have one channel um, when, you know, things get interrupted, like we have a huge business in offices. Well, offices closed. That's right. like beyond our control. And like, did we predict that offices across the U.S. would close? Nope. I mean, we didn't, but, but because we had these other channels, we were able to, you know, really redirect kind of, you know, what, what we're doing. So, I wouldn't say that there's any different lessons like from this pandemic that I learned other than the fact, you know, that being prepared doesn't always mean that, you know, you've got a checklist, right? You, you operate your business in a way that is, um, is smart, right? As smart as you can possibly be. And then going back to something that I talked about earlier, 
that, you know, 2009, just as an example, during the financial crisis, I mean, that was a really tough time for us. It was a tough time for a lot of businesses. But what I learned is that you just don't really know how long things are going to take. And so Mm -hmm. I was looking at March and saying, look, we've got to get money in the bank. Like, I want to have enough money for the next couple of years. And a lot of people were like, oh, you know, remain calm, do this. I'm like, no, we're, our business is doing really well right now. We should go out and raise. And people were like, ha, 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 you're not going to be able to raise during a pandemic. And we did. We raised a ton of money in the middle of it on Zoom. You know, it was like, <laughs> and so again, I think, that is, um, you can always get stuff done if um, if you have your business set up properly mm-hmm. and you know you're you're running it in a way that is maybe you're a little paranoid, right? You're running it in a way that that there could be a pandemic, and um, but also like celebrating the wins and celebrating sort of what you've been able to accomplish in the past. I think it just goes to what I was saying earlier. Really helps you um, to kind of manage not only you know, yourself and your business, but also your people saying, you know, like, look, we've been through stuff, like we got this, like, you know, stay well and, you know, and keep pushing forward, but also, you know, reminding people that, that they can do it, I think is really the, the key thing that I've learned and, and really the importance of, you know, this time for me. Yeah, we were, talking about one of your employees that I've had contact with and saying how, how good she is. And uh, you've hired a lot of people in the last uh, number of years. Uh, what, are, what are some guidelines that you give as far as to, to people that are looking to hire maybe their first leadership team? Well, I think there's, I've always had this theory that, um, that understanding sort of what you're like really good at doesn't mean that you can't touch other things in the company. So what I always explain to entrepreneurs is that, you know, something as basic as like a balance sheet, really understanding every aspect of the company, I think is really important. Even when we're innovating, um, we just did a hand hand sanitizer. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as I'm calling like, different uh, plants and and talking to people, they're like, aren't you the CEO of like a water company? You know, I'm like, yeah, but I like to, you know, get in here and really understand and really start it, um, kickstart it so that then I hire people that are better than me. So Mm. don't be afraid to like roll up your sleeves and get a little dirty in the process, but then also hire people that are better than you. Because so often, and I I think this really holds true for even non-C-suite people, like, you end up thinking like, I'm going to hire people that can do the job that I, that I don't want to versus actually hiring people that are actually, you know, better than you, that you look up to, that you respect. It doesn't matter about their title. It matters about like what they're, you know, what they're really good at, what they're passionate about. And so I think that that's true for our entire, you know, not just the C-suite, but also our entire team. I mean, I I really encourage all of our managers to hire people that know more than they don't because I think that that's where people get not only frustrated um, with their team when they're hiring people where like, I always have to tell them what to do every single day, right? Like nobody likes to do that. But in addition, it doesn't allow you as a manager um, to go and do other things and keep learning. And, And that's, you know, another aspect that I talk about in the book too, that you know, I think that burnout and, um, and, you know, anger and maybe even mental health to some extent really starts with the fact that people just get tired of like constantly teaching, right? And sometimes, and if we could look at, you know, look at management as a dialogue and that it's not just about you being at the top of the heap, um, or having managers at the top of the heap instead and in teaching all day long, that's exhausting, right? Instead, trying to figure out like, how do you create engagement by allowing people to actually do other things in the company that maybe are outside of their wheelhouse that are interesting, right? Like that they like allows them to kind of explore and get outside of their element and be a student a little bit. And And I think like that's what we've done in our company with you know, a, a number of different people and they, and it ends up when people 
have done that, they are, they are not only more engaged and, and sort of better employees, but they're also just um, happier and, and more likely to um, really kind of, you know, just be happier in life, I believe. Good. So I have to ask this question. I know you've been asked it probably every interview you have. What's your favorite uh, flavor of water? I've got a uh, bottle here and some strategically sure. placed back here. But uh, what what do you uh, what do you enjoy? That's Thank like you. asking which of my I know which child is favorite. Right? Yeah, I know. I know. So um, <laughs> I, you know, I would say that if I had my whole fridge filled yeah. with all of it and I could just grab a bottle, we just developed a. Um, blueberry lemon that is uh -huh. so darn good and it was hard to do um but i would say that or the single flavors i'd say i love cherry i love them all but i mean i really love cherry i tend to just grab a cherry if it's like right there um but i'm drinking a pineapple right now and i'm quite happy with it i had i don't know lemon clementine like i drink okay. them all day long uh -huh. Oh, this is a uh, strawberry kiwi, which is really good. And really it's, good. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I, th I think you're right. People get bored drinking water and you've, you've got to, when I look at the size of cup that I have to refill several times during a day, that's a lot of, a lot of just straight water to drink and it gets boring. Definitely. Um, so you've developed some other things. You're, you're an entrepreneur. You, you showed the, the hand sanitizer. You developed a sunscreen. You have deodorant, uh, and it, it seems like it's a personal problem that you see or an opportunity to, to help people. And, and uh, talk a little bit about that brand, your idea going forward. It, you're branching out into some other, other areas. Yeah, I mean, it was it, there was no major strategic plan around it. I mean, people are like, oh, I get it now. You know, that's sure. what, I'm like, not really. Like, I mean, for me, I, I really wanted to develop a sunscreen or I, or I should say I really wanted a sunscreen that helped me um, wear sunscreen and I, I started asking myself like why don't I wear sunscreen because I didn't want to put certain ingredients on my face and mm -hmm. also I just didn't love the smell and I, and then when I got um, some you know pre-cancer basal cell stuff on my nose I learned like I got to start getting serious about wearing sunscreen and and when I looked around at the options and really the ingredients, I, I didn't want to wear a product that had oxybenzone in it. And I wanted it to be clear. Sure. And so I was looking for the product and I couldn't find it. And so then I started making it in my kitchen and not really knowing what I was doing. And then we had essences on the counter from in, in my kitchen um, from the water. And I thought, well, wow, it'd be great if I had grapefruit and pear and some of these others. So I started just playing around with it again, not really thinking it was a product. And then a friend of mine who used to work in, um, in the beauty industry said, oh, all sunscreen is regulated by the FDA. So you have to like submit an application. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you're doing this for Hint and I was like doing it for Hint, I'm like just making the stuff at home. I, you know, was kind of joking around about it. And then, then of course I was curious, which I am very curious. And I was like, oh, I wonder what I do to get a product on, you know, it, in a sunscreen and and so uh we got the fda approval like a year later and that's when you know we went out with it with like hint was just a holding name i figured oh, i can change the name later um and then what was so interesting about that launch in particular we heard from customers right away that were so excited that we were like doing a sunscreen that they would like love and the smell and everything was great um, the beverage industry was quite upset about the fact that I was like developing a sunscreen and, and I thought it was really humorous because I was never launching a beverage for the beverage industry, right? Like I was like, why do you guys care, right? And, and then the most interesting thing was that we had sunscreens. We had put um, no oxybenzone right on the bottle. And then we had sunscreen companies that were developing sunscreens that said no oxybenzone on it. They weren't doing that prior to me launching a beverage company, launching a sunscreen. And so I thought if like, this is so fascinating because this is not, I'm not even looking at the, these guys. I'm just doing what I do every single day, which is like solving problems. Right. And, and so if I really want, if I see a category in an industry like, I don't even have to figure out who runs those companies, right? I, and tell them, you're doing wrong, you know, or you shouldn't have those ingredients. 
I can actually build a brand and launch a company or launch a product and tell them what I think is wrong with their product. And then they'll reformulate these companies and because that's exactly what happened. And otherwise, like there's so many bad products out there and when in sunscreens as well as, you know, lots of other products and they're not, they're not going to listen to me or they're not going to listen to the consumer. Right. I mean, the consumers will share that with them, but they don't, they won't do it. And so just by launching better products, that is our purpose, right? Mm. It's not just about helping consumers. It's also about helping these large you know, companies and in categories all over the place, like, you know, where are these guys coming from? Like, they're, they're like, they're, we didn't even know that they were there. Like, that's been said about us in the press. And they're like, you know, they came from nowhere. It's like, we're not coming for you. We're just telling you to do better. And because our consumer wants health, and we're going to show you how to do it. We're going to be your innovation team. And we're going to go do it. And we're going to still sell our product all day long. You'll, you have way more money than we do. You can go be great. We just want you to not have unhealthy crap right on the shelf. That is my purpose. And I get a lot of pleasure out of seeing you, you know, really, really go and reformulate. So, so that is, you know, that has now continued with, um, with a deodorant. And then we just did a hand sanitizer. And again, it's all around health. It's all around solving problems, but it's, it's just a lot of fun to, to do that stuff. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your, your, uh, your family has uh, tested some of the, the stuff that you've, you've had as you get it in development and, and uh, say, does this smell right? Or in, so that it sounds like a whole family. I know your husband is involved in the business. So do you think your uh, kids will be involved later on and uh, do they have a desire? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they've definitely worked a little bit in the business and summers, you know, they've done different internships as well. Uh, look, I just want, I think what a, a lot of parents want, which is I want my kids to be happy. Sure. That is the most important thing. And, you know, I think them actually seeing their, you know, their mom and their dad, like do something that, you know, they're happy about and taking on, you know, being the underdog and taking on the big company, like that's pretty cool. Yeah. Right. And, and so hopefully they'll not only find something that they're really passionate about, but also they'll go, they'll not be, you know, afraid to get out of the gate, afraid to go take on challenges. And because they know that it, that it's possible to go and do great things if they set their mind to it and work hard and be creative and all of those things. So outside of work, what do you, what do you like to do to, to recharge? So I hike every morning. I live in Marin County, just over the bridge um, in, of San Francisco. And I have two Labradors. One's asleep in my room over here. She, she likes it when I'm podcasting and she just, uh, she goes to sleep. Sometimes she snores um, along the way. So I have to, I, I, her name's Sadie. And I, I'm like, Sadie, shh, be quiet. Not, to, not today. She's pretty quiet over there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, I think, nature is, is, uh, it's an underrated, um, you know, thing that exists out there that, that clearly is, uh, we moved to Marin County from San Francisco when I started Hint because, um, there aren't many public school options in San Francisco. So it's mostly private schools. And so I wanted to self-finance, um, the company initially. And so we were like, we have four kids, let's go for free school somewhere. And, and so we ended up moving out to Marin County for that. And uh, I'm so happy I did. Like, I didn't know how much I would really appreciate like nature and really mm -hmm. crave it. And now when I'm traveling a lot, not during COVID, but prior to this, like I've just found that I'm, I'm, um, I'm constantly wanting to hike and get outside and explore. And there, it's always, you know, even if you go on the same trail, there's always something different, like different trees, different animals. Sure. And um, so, yeah, so it's, it's uh, that I would say that that's the biggest um, thing. And then also reading and exploring. I think for me, I just feel like I'm constantly, I'm just, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly hoarding information. Like I, I love, you know, reading about um, entrepreneurs and, and people who have challenged themselves and, and um, 
you know, whether it's reading or listening or, um, you know, whether it's on Audible or TED Talks or, sure. you know, I'm constantly looking for that. So what, besides your book, which again, we want to encourage people to, to read Undaunted, uh, what, what other books do you recommend to, to others? Um, so many of them. Uh, actually, there's one book in particular that I'm reading right now because I'm very passionate about it. It's Aaron Brockovich's um, new mm. book. I'll, everybody knows who Aaron Brockovich was, but Superman's Not Coming. And it's, it's really talking about something that I'm very passionate about, which is the, um, she terms it as the national water crisis, which is, um, you know, really what's in our water supply. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't really know, um, you know, the stuff that is sitting in our water, not only lead, everybody had heard about Flint and New Jersey mm -hmm. um, to some extent, and sort of, you know, the fact that water supplies had to be shut off. But there's this other ingredient called PFAS, which is in our water supply, that actually is a known carcinogen that is um, pretty darn bad. And they're actually finding that it may um, be tied to uh, people being able to develop antibodies um, from COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm working on a huge initiative in Washington right now um, to try and uh, actually take something before Congress, um, working with Congresswoman Jackie Speer um, to just build awareness and potentially get PFAS considered by the EPA as a dangerous substance. And Erin mm -hmm. um, is, I didn't know this, but she's kind of working um, on the same issue in a different way. Like she's working really on, on local levels, which is also great, um, but I'm actually trying to kind of started at the EPA and actually forced the EPA to, you know, really regulate a lot of this, you know, stuff that's going on. So again, it, I, I love it because it's, um, it's really, it's informative. Um, I read lots of different um, things. I would say that the other one, um, actually a couple of them that I've got over here, um, The Infinite Game, Simon Sinek, um, I love him. Um, he's amazing and he really gets me motivated and, and thinking about lots of great things. And, um, and, uh, actually this, this is fairly, this guy, uh, Bruce Tulgan, do you know, Bruce? No, I really don't. interesting guy. Oh. Um, he actually has a podcast as well that I was just on, but he went to college with my husband and he really talks about some of the challenges that, you know, being a leader and being an executive have and, and sort of like, you know, being at the um, kind of the top, you're expected to sort of like know how to solve all these problems. Sure. And, and so he, it really, a lot of his books, he's written a series of books and they're really enjoyable on sort mm -hmm. of much more about leadership and how do you lead. And, and so again, I, I'm really like a sponge. I like reading you know, lots of different things. Um, Untamed, obviously, with Glennon Good Doyle um, as well. Like, I love that. So I, I, I don't just read one category. Sure. Well, how would somebody learn more about you? I listened to your podcast uh, and uh, definitely uh, encourage people to, to check that out. But uh, tell us a little bit more where, where to uh, find more about you. Yeah, definitely. So the podcast is called The Kara Golden Show. And um and uh, all over social at Kara Golden. And, um, and just overall, I think uh, you'll learn a lot about me by reading the book too. I think that there's, there's quite a bit. In fact, people who are, have known me for a long time, they were like, I had no idea that, about this. So it's been really fun um, you know, hearing from so many people that I haven't necessarily touched base with in, in years. My, my former boss that I talk about in the book from time she's in there and and uh you know she's she's uh she was saying you know wow like looking back on sort of those times and you know it's it's pretty fun to sort of you know see it and and you know read it and and uh, a lot of fun so good what uh, what parting advice would you give a, a newer up and coming leader I think the key thing is, is don't feel like you have to have it all figured out. I think that, you know, the, the more transparent you can be um, with people and also with your, um, with yourself, 
Um, I mean, I, I get called every day um, authentic, right? And I, what I think is so frustrating is, and, and I think about it as, you know, people used to think like, oh, if you're called authentic or you're a little like different than other people, then maybe like that's not a good thing. What I find is like more and more um, you, you, as a leader, you tend to be much more approachable when you are authentic. There's so many, um, you know, people um, gravitate towards you when you are actually sharing that you don't have it all figured out, that maybe right. something happened to you in the past that, um, that was not a good situation. And here's why, you know, you have opinions about sort of moving forward in a certain way. So again, don't be afraid to not only try, but also, you know, be yourself and, um, and really share like what, value you believe you can add today and what you're working towards and some of your goals. Great. Well, I sure appreciate you taking the time out to, to talk and, and definitely encourage everybody to, to go get uh, the book on Donald and uh, check out your podcast. It's uh, definitely been great to hear your story. Appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.